This video lecture is part two of my presentation on social influence utilizing the ASH type of methodology. The ASH methodology involved having a, a group of people uh, in a room who would answer questions uh, and they would all be working for the experimenter. These uh, confederates would typically answer the question incorrectly and the true participant is placed in the position of having to either give the correct answer or go along with the group, conform to the group opinion and um, uh, feel at ease with the group. So it's a dynamic tension where the participant has to decide whether to uh, go with the group or go with the truth. Around the same time that uh, Ash was doing that, he published his study in 1952, around that same time Stanley Schachter was working on a somewhat different methodology uh, but it's related to the Ash uh, type of research. Schachter's publication in 1951, Deviation, Rejection, and Communication, had a different methodology in the sense that there was no correct answer. What he was looking at was a, a discussion group where participants in fairly large groups were given the task of talking about a case study. After discussing the case, they had to rate each other. The participants in the discussion group had to give ratings of how much they liked or disliked the other members of the group. Now there were four different discussion groups but we're only interested in one for the purposes of this talk. The discussion group of interest for us is the case study group uh, and as, as Schachter describes it, in a typical meeting after preliminary introductions each member read a short version of the Johnny Rocco case, the life history of a juvenile delinquent which ended as Johnny was awaiting sentence for a minor crime. The Johnny Rocco case is, uh, it was published in 1948 by a different author, and it was used in those uh, uh, mid 20th century um, uh, period abnormal psychology textbooks. And Johnny is described as coming from an unstable home life. He's really a good kid, but uh, he, he has a lot of uh, disrespect for authority figures. He doesn't like the police. He commits a lot of uh, different types of low-level crimes and he gets in trouble for them. And so, you know, the case study goes in and s in s into some detail on all of this, about, uh, I guess, about five or six pages worth of detail. Uh, and after reading that, the members of the discussion group in Schachter's study debate what to do with this individual, Johnny Rocco, for about 45 minutes. After they come to a conclusion of their discussion group, uh, one of the things that they're asked to do is to rank each member of the group in terms of how much they liked working with that member or how much they uh, did not like working with that member. And so the, the groups had eight to ten members, three of whom were Confederates, and it's important to understand the different types of Confederates that we have in this experiment. The three Confederates were instructed differently. The modal person was instructed to take the viewpoint of the majority no matter what that viewpoint happened to be. So that's the, uh, I guess you could say the true conformist, the person who just goes along with the, the viewpoint that everyone else is expressing. But he's acting. This is uh, someone who's acting the role. The slider is instructed to start in opposition to the majority opinion no matter what it is. And then over the time period of the discussion group, uh, the slider joins with the majority viewpoint. And then the third one, the deviate, goes against the majority uh, viewpoint the entire time. And here we see the results of the study in terms of the rankings that the participants have for each other. Uh, and of course for the naive subjects, the true subjects, we're not really concerned with how they ranked each other. We're only concerned with how the naive subjects ranked the different confederates. Lower rankings are better. That means that the uh, uh, participants on average like that person better, scored them as a higher rank. You know, you, uh, who do you like the best? List them in, in order of preference. So your first choice would have a very low number, uh, whereas the last choice person would have a high number that indicates rejection. And what we can see here is that the person who's acting as the deviate has a very high score and in fact that number is 6.44. Uh, I highlighted the uh, top row which is the only group that we're actually interested in here. The deviate 
has a significantly higher ranking than the modal or the slider confederate does. And there's no significant difference between the modal person and the slider. I think what this tells us is that it's documentation that members of a group who are uh, expressing an opinion, particularly if it's a cohesive group, uh, find that the individual who disagrees with a group is not someone that they like to be around. That they, uh, uh, they reject that individual and their, their ratings here reflect that rejection. Also, I think the other takeaway here is that if you happen to be someone who disagrees with a, uh, a group majority opinion, you're probably aware that the people in that group majority find that this is not something that they like about you. And this may be the source of some conformity behavior. So that's an interesting historical study uh, very early on, 1951. Moving on from there through other types of uh, research, one study that was very influential, it's been cited uh, numerous times, is a meta-analysis by uh, Rod Bond and Peter Smith. And what they did in 1960, uh, 1996 is they meta-analyzed all the different types of ash studies that had been done, as well as Crutchfield type of conformity experiments. Crutchfield style conformity is uh, similar to the ash, except that the stimulus that you're looking at, it's not a solid line that you have a comparison line to, to uh, decide whether it's right or wrong. It's more ambiguous than that. It's like looking at uh, modern artwork where there's no clear answer. And uh, it's another opportunity for conformity, but I think it fits better with the Sharif type of conformity, where you're relying on the information from others rather than knowing that there is a correct answer. There's no correct answer in the Crutchfield style. At any rate, we have in the uh, Bond and Smith meta-analysis, 94 different ASH experiments that had been done between 1952 and 1996. And that's a lot. A meta-analysis, if you're new to this, is simply a way of taking the uh, effect size from each of the different studies using the variable of interest and averaging those effect sizes across each other. And there are only a couple of results that I want to talk about here. There are a lot of different very interesting results in the Bond and Smith study. But one thing to note is the magnitude of the effect sizes. Using Cohen's D, uh, what, uh, what Bond and Smith did is they arranged the effect sizes in a stem and leaf plot. If you're unfamiliar with a stem and leaf plot, the way to read this is that the top score, at the very top of this uh, column, the three point, and then there's a long space, two, represents the number 3.2, followed by 3.1, and then where you see the blank space with the number 2 in front, so the stem has 2 point, and then the leaf has nothing, that means that there was no value there. There was no value. So what, the, what they're doing here is they're arranging all the different effect sizes based on the stem, the zeros, ones, and twos, and threes, and the leaves. So at the very bottom where you have zero point and then there are two zeros at the other end, that means that there were two studies that had a complete zero effect size. Now I haven't investigated, I have not investigated those two studies. Those are probably studies where they simply reported that it was non-significant and did not give sufficient information to extrapolate an effect size. The second line from the bottom has zero point and then there's two, 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 two. That means that there were four studies in which the effect size was 0.2. And then there, there are three threes at the end. That means that there were three studies in which the effect size was determined to be 0.3. So each one of these numbers on the right-hand side represents a different study. Each individual digit represents a different study. And what we can see is that the effect sizes are really rather large. The way to interpret the magnitude of the effect size for Cohen's D, according to Cohen at any rate, is that 0 0.2 is small, 0 0.5 is medium, and 0 0.8 is large. Now when Cohen came up with these metrics for the interpretation of the size of the effect, he was basically guessing. He was suggesting this as a benchmark, but it's not based on anything empirical. There's an interesting study that recently came out 
illustrating that the uh, empirically derived average effects are probably a bit smaller than what Cohen thought them to be. At any rate, for the ASH type of uh, studies, what we can see here is that the conformity rate is really very high. Just based on looking at this graph, it looks like about four-fifths of the studies have an effect size of 0.8 or higher. And uh, the very highest is 3.2, which is, an, uh, I guess you could say, an astronomically high effect size. It simply illustrates that the, the, the magnitude of conforming behavior was quite high relative to a control group. But that's, that's to be expected. We already sort of knew that based on our discussion in my previous video of the original ASH study. Uh, my point in showing this is to show that, well, the, uh, the, the effects are large. The effects of conformity behavior uh, in ASH type of studies and Crutchfield studies is really quite large and that a lot of studies have been done. Now when you flip the uh, stem and leaf on its side, you can see the shape of the distribution. We can see that there's a bit of a skew. In fact, that, uh, that I should flip it again, but uh, when you look at the numbers in reverse and mirror image, um, it looks rather funny, so I didn't do that. But the higher score should be on the right-hand side, which would make it positively skewed. Across all the studies that Bond and Smith uh, examined for the uh, conformity effect, they found a few patterns. There was a small but significant effect of women conforming more. Uh, more conformity when subject is in the in-group uh, was found. There was a small but significant reduction in conformity in more recent studies. So people are still conforming in these types of studies, but not as much as they used to. But that's, that's a rather small reduction. And, and this meta-analysis was 1996, so it would be interesting to see what the patterns are today. There was a very strong effect of the size of the majority. And one of the studies that was done uh, that was included in this meta-analysis indicated uh, a slight effect of intellectual autonomy uh, reducing the conformity effect. That is to say that people who felt uh, or who were measured as intellectually more autonomous uh, conformed a bit less. And there was a slight indication that ideological conservatism increased conformity. Now that's an interesting finding. There's a lot of more recent research on uh, ideological uh, concomitants in, in the psychological characteristics, but I won't go into that here. It's a very interesting line of research and there's a lot of it, but that goes beyond the scope of this particular presentation. In 2010, I was at the American uh, Asso the Association for Psychological Science conference in Chicago, and I saw that uh, this researcher from Japan was presenting an ASH study. I took a photograph of him, Kazuo Mori. He had a, an ingenious method. He, he used an optical device in order to create the ASH illusion. His paper that he published in the uh, International Journal of Psychology in 2010 is titled, No Need to Fake It, Reproduction of the Ash Experiment Without Confederates. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting technique. So uh, this is an illustration from his publication. And when you're wearing the specific type of glasses that he's got, it will give you an optical illusion that the green part of the line on the left is, in fact, black. That is to say, uh, this, is, this is set up as an illustration to show us that uh, when you are wearing these particular glasses, you'll see something different. Uh, and in this way, he can trick people into believing that they're seeing something when, in fact, they're not. Uh, the, the whole point here is that uh, with this device, the methodology in an ASH experiment no longer needs to have actors. You can give naive subjects uh, these glasses to wear and uh, they will say with absolute certainty something different than the person who's wearing normal glasses. Now the, the participants won't know who's got the special glasses and who doesn't. So depending on which pair of glasses the participant is wearing, they may see uh, a line that matches with uh, comparison line number two or with comparison line number three. And in that way, naive subjects can say with utmost confidence that they're seeing one thing while the target participant, the one who's got the special 
version of these classes, we'll be seeing something different. So it's a clever methodology that can reduce the uh, training and difficulty in conducting an ASH experiment. Now, Murray and his co-author, uh, Arai, published uh, this uh, set of results in 2010 using a Japanese sample, Japanese students. They were looking specifically at males and females in order to de determine if there's a gender effect for, for women conforming more, which had been noted in the Bond and Smith meta-analysis, that there was a slight difference for uh, women to conform more. And what Mori found is that there's a very large uh, gender difference, at least in Japan, for this small sample of uh, participants. Now, I, I would urge caution in interpreting this set of data simply because there are very few men. Um, and so it, it's hard to know how representative such a small sample is. When I originally read this set of results, I thought that uh, the rate of conforming for the men in this study was really rather low. Uh, and so there may be some other explanation for that. Uh, and particularly because it's a sample of only 10 males, it, it, it calls into question, I think, to some extent, uh, whether there could be an alternative explanation. But at least on the face of it, women in the study were conforming substantially more and significantly more. One reason that I suspected that the rate of conformity among the men in this study was rather low is simply based on what I've heard about Japanese culture, that there's a very high rate of conformity uh, within the culture itself. Uh, and I base that to some extent on uh, anecdotes, things that I've heard uh, in, in discussions with people who've lived in Japan, but also in uh, David Bailey's book, Forces of Order, uh, Policing Modern Japan. Uh, Bailey is an expert on international styles of policing. I took a class when I was an undergraduate with Professor Bailey at uh, SUNY Albany. And there's, an, there's a description in his text indicating that uh, in one episode, uh, police in Japan were able to apprehend a burglar because uh, while he was burglarizing an apartment, he had to stop and put his shoes on when he heard the police come. Now that's all of the description that is provided within this text, uh, Policing Modern Japan. But when I took Professor Bailey's class, he went into a little bit more detail. His description of the actual case went something like this. Uh, the police were called in order to investigate a potential burglary in progress. The police arrive at the apartment building and they go to the, the door of the apartment where they suspect that the burglar is still inside. All of the police take off their shoes before going inside and the reason why they were able to get the burglar, the reason that the police were able to catch the burglar, is because he had taken his shoes off when he entered the apartment and he had to put his shoes back on before climbing out the window, thus enabling the police, even with all the noise and commotion of their taking their shoes off, to get into the apartment in time to catch this burglar. And I think what that illustrates uh, rather nicely is a, a, a conformity effect, that even people who've chosen a, a life of crime conform to social norms, uh, such as taking shoes off when entering an apartment in Japan. There's really far too much research on conformity to cover all of it here, but there are a few more recent ones that uh, uh, are very interesting and, and merit some discussion. In 2012, uh, a letter was published in Nature, the journal Nature, titled, A 61 Million Person Experiment in Social Influence and Political Mobilization. What the researchers here did, this is Robert Bond, not the same person as Rod Bond from the meta-analysis. What the researchers here did is on one day uh, at the uh, 2010 congressional midterm election, they were able to have 61 million Facebook users' pages uh, provided with a message related to voting. And it's really very interesting what they did is they uh, did experiment in terms of having different materials, although we don't have random assignments, so that limits the interpretation of it to some extent. Uh, but we have two different versions of the message that was given to these individuals. Today is election day. This is the informational one on top. Find your polling place on the, uh, on the U.S. politics page and click I voted. And so this is a clickable button that you see here underneath where it's in blue. It says I voted. 
and you have the number on the side saying that 1,155,376 people on Facebook have voted. The second message is different in the sense that it also shows people from your friends list who have voted. So what they were able to do is they were able to link ag algorithmically uh, the list of people who voted from your friends and it shows you the icons of those who you know who have voted. So the question is whether the informational message is equally as powerful as the social message that has all the same information plus the fact that your friends here voted. And what they report is that users who receive the social message, that is to say the people's faces from your friends list, were 2.08 percent uh, more likely to click the I voted button than those who received the informational message alone. And I think the best way to interpret that is that it's a conformity effect. Uh, we don't really have the same pressure to vote if it's just an informational campaign as we do if we know that all of our friends voted. So that uh, that can be a very motivational thing. If we if we really wanted to use something like Facebook as a platform for encouraging voting, this would be something that would be implemented on a regular basis, that everyone who's on Facebook would be able to click I voted and uh, that information would be shared. Now there's some, you know, question naturally about privacy concerns. Of course, you don't have to click that you voted. If you do click it, probably it should tell you that your uh, profile will be shared with people. I, I guess that was a little bit controversial at the time. I don't think that this particular study was in the news very much. But there was another study that was a couple of years later, in 2014. Here's an article from the New York Times. Facebook tinkers with users' emotions in newsfeed experiments during outcry. And there was a big outcry about this particular study because what they were doing in this study was the researchers had the ability through Facebook to change the type of information that people saw on their news feeds. And the way that this particular study worked, it goes something like this. They manipulated the extent to which uh, users saw positive or negative valence items in their newsfeed. And the people who were enrolled, the total sample size was 689,003. They were not given informed consent. There was no informed consent needed according to the IRB review that reviewed the study. And, and that's, what, that's what prompted the outcry, that people's uh, lives were being tinkered with in a potentially negative way, encouraging them to see more negativity in the world, and it had been done without their uh, express informed consent. Uh, the, the researchers defended their commission of the study, and the IRB that had been involved also defended it, and ultimately there was no negative outcome from that. But it, it, it stirred some debate about privacy, which is probably a good thing. And the results that they reported look like this. This study was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, June 17, 2014. So people either had the negative types of stories reduced or the positive types of stories reduced. And what the researchers wanted to know was whether or not people who had negativity reduced turn use fewer negative valenced words. And same thing for positivity reduced. Would those individuals then use fewer uh, positively valenced words? And in fact, uh, that's what happened. The, the results were highly significant, although the magnitude of the effect is really very small. Now the previous study on voting, uh, encouraging voting, they found a 2% increase based on being able to see that your friends have voted, a 2% increase in reporting of voting. And we don't know if that's actual voting, of course, but 2% is a, a pretty big jump in terms of self-reported voting behavior. The Facebook study by comparison is not nearly as large in magnitude. The magnitude of the effect, I think that you can see if you uh, look to the left-hand side of the screen where you have positive words in percent and negative words in percent, we're talking about tenths of a percent. So it's a very small change in the amount of use of negative or positive words in the experimental condition relative to the control. So if we just look at the left-hand side, the bars on the left-hand side, where the experimental group has negativity reduced in their newsfeed, you have about one-tenth of one percent fewer 
negative words used by those Facebook users in their own uh, comments and various different things on their on their own news feed. And that corresponds with a uh, concomitant increase in positive words. The effects are really very small. If we're talking about tenths of percents of words, we have no idea if it's merely mimicry versus uh, change in attitudes. We would also expect that if there are any changes in attitudes, it should be very short-lived. But it's interesting because what it shows us is that merely tweaking what a person sees online is sufficient to change both voting behavior and their use of positively valenced or negatively valenced words. So you don't have to be in a gigantic mass wedding like the Moonies used to do in order to have a conformity effect. You, we, we're exposed to this sort of stuff online all the time now. You don't have to be in a group like Soko Gakkai, which is a Buddhist group in Japan, where uh, uniformity of dress is required. These are a couple of photos that my dad shot of Soko Gakkai. We don't have to be members of a, a, a malignant cult like the Rajneeshis, uh, though some might argue with me, but the, the leaders of this cult were arrested on a variety of different charges, in, including poisoning. This is what we tend to think of when we think of conformity uh, as a very negative thing, but it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, conformity is something that we're facing on a regular basis now in our uh, social media. And I'll have more to say about the social media element and I'll have a little bit more to say about the social media element of conformity in a different uh, video lecture that I put together. Uh, thanks for listening.